Compass North Fort Worth, how we feeling tonight? Good, very good, very good. You guys are my favorite campus to come and teach at. Um, I don't tell that to all the other campuses, except for when I preach at those campuses. Um, man, I, I'm super glad to be with you guys. Th this series, brand new, um, has been an awesome way for us to start this series, not just as individuals, but as an entire church. And we've gotten to sort of talk about the, the places that, that, that the church ha has fallen short throughout history, but the way that God may be calling us to, to return to something that for Jesus was, was brand new. And, and personally, I love the local church. I mean, and I know that some of you love the local church as well. Some of you remember the day that, that you got dragged to church by someone and you made the decision to get baptized. And it was a celebration, but you've never forgotten it. If someone comes up to you and says, hey, when did you get baptized? You can give them the exact day, almost the time to the point. The local church has played a significant part in your story. Some of you remember when you got saved in church. Some of you remember when you got connected at church and you found friends. You thought you were a weirdo and no one would ever like you. And then there were people who did like you and they were headed in the same direction in life as you. Man, we, we love the local church. Now, if you find yourself in here tonight and, and you're new to the Jesus thing or you're sort of skeptical about the, the Christianity part of this, I, hey, I, I totally get it. But our hope is that you would one day, too, love the local church. But even, even with all that love, I'm not naive to not recognize that there are plenty of reasons that people throughout the years have resisted the local church that they've, they've resisted the, the life and the offering of Jesus. They've resisted the, the narrative of Christianity. They, they've resisted organized religion. And honestly, the thing that breaks my heart is not when people resist the church, right? Listen, it, Christians have one of the most exclusive belief systems in the world. We believe that Jesus was not just a man, but he was the son of God. And if someone resists the church for that, I get it. That's worth the conversation. But what breaks my heart is when we see people resist the church for reasons that, honestly, we should also resist. And the way that we've talked about this through, through these last few weeks is through this lens of what we've called the temple model. And the temple model is a, a form of religion that we've seen throughout all of history, whether it's in Assyria or Babylon or, or even in ancient Israel. And what we've said about the temple model is that it always consists of four things— there's always a sacred place. There's a place that's marked, whether by walls, whether it's literally a temple, whether it's, it's a spot, a, a geographical location where people have said, this is where God is, and you cannot experience God outside of the confines of this space. And typically around those sacred spaces are what we call sacred texts. So you can think it might be a book, it might be uh, hieroglyphics, it might be scrolls, whatever it is, but, but these texts have power because these texts get interpreted by sacred men. Ladies, I'm sorry, it's rarely sacred women in these, in these religious circumstances, almost always sacred men, and they have the interpretation. And what they do is they tell their sincere followers or their superstitious followers, whatever you want to call them, that they tell them exactly how they need to live their lives. And usually the narrative goes something like, if you live your life this way, man, God will love you more. He will bless you more. You'll have more financial wealth. You'll have more power. But if you don't live this way, well, it gets hot in the place that you're going. It, it's some narrative like this. This is what the temple model does. But what we've said over these last few weeks is that Jesus didn't come to sort of carry something old into the future. He, he was creating something brand new. And his hope was that he could sort of conquer this temple model way of thinking, help people see God for who he really is, the way that he actually feels about them. Jesus wanted to start something brand new. But you know, the problem is, is that over time, the Jesus movement has become diluted. I, I remember as a kid, um, one of my favorite moments in school, some of you, you're gonna have to take a little more time to think back to when you were a kid, you're just a little, um, you're wiser than me. Um, but I remember in school, the best moment was when you would show up and your teacher or your principal or whoever would say, we have an assembly today. Because what that meant was you were getting out of some class. So for me, I was like, let's please avoid math. If we can have no math class, that would be awesome, right? I'm a pastor. I can't do math. There's, there's 700 people in here tonight if you let me count. Um, but, but they said there's going to be an assembly. 
It was one of the best moments. And, and I remember as a, a second grader, an assembly that I was called into. I know what you're thinking. How do you remember something from when you were seven years old? Because I never forgot the bizarre nature of this assembly. They drag all of these grade school kids, at the time it was probably four or 500 of us, into this large auditorium room. And up at the front is this woman with this long white folding table and these three large buckets on the table. We're talking like Home Depot buckets, right? Things you like mix concrete in, these huge buckets. And they have lids on them. And she does this thing that, that people do in rooms with large groups of people that I never understand. She goes, I need three volunteers. Everyone's hand shot up immediately, my hand included. Um, we don't need to process this fully, but I was not picked for this assembly endeavor. Um, I, I still hold on to it. I think about it frequently. Um, she, she calls up these three kids, and they all get to stand in front of these three buckets. She then hands them spoons. She hands each of them a large spoon, and she opens the lid on the bucket, and inside these buckets are full of chocolate ice cream. Now, Mm, I hear that. I hear that. Say that. Do that again when I say something that's like really powerful and meaningful later in the sermon, because um, I'm gonna remember where it came from. She opens it up. Chocolate ice cream. Now, I, this is in the Midwest, so it's probably not bluebell, but it's still a lot of chocolate ice cream. So she looks at these three kids and she says, "Just dig in." So they're a little apprehensive, right? They're like, "We don't know this lady. She just gave us ice cream. I'm pretty sure our parents told us this would happen at some point. We should say no." Um, they just start eating, right, slowly. And then all of a sudden, they're just like going to town. Now, I was going to a Christian school when this happened. So the lady is up front talking. I have no idea what she was talking about. I'm sure it was something like moral and ethically important, probably something that could have saved me a lot of the trouble I got into as a teenager later. But I was just upset that I had not been picked to eat all of this ice cream. Well, all of a sudden, the, the kid on the far right, he's scooping out. And on the end of his spoon is the handle of like a, a trash bag. And he sort of stops. Everyone in the room is like paying attention. The kid next to him is, is scooping ice cream and, and she pulls out like an old McDonald's cup. And the same thing happens to the next kid. They start pulling trash out of the ice cream bucket. I don't know what the illustration was. But what happened was she had filled these buckets with trash and then poured chocolate ice cream all the way up to the top. I'm sure the point had something to do with sin. I, again, no idea. I tell you that story to simply say this. We were mortified in that room when we found out there was trash in it, right? And the three kids who got picked, they're like getting made fun of the rest of the day because they ate garbage. I tell you that story to simply say this. Even the greatest things in the world can find themselves becoming diluted. Even the greatest things in the world can start to find things in them that were never supposed to be there. And that's why we've started the year with this series, because our hope is if we can figure out how to avoid some of these things, the temple model way of thinking, we can never, we don't ever have to return to that way of following Jesus. We can actually step into the kind of faith, the brand new version of faith that Jesus has for all of us. So what I want to do as we wrap this up, I just want to give you four things that I believe we need to redefine. Four words, four phrases, four ideas that Jesus himself redefined, and when he did it, would have been, would have been mind-blowing to the temple model of thinking, because again, he was starting something brand new. And I believe if we can sort of hold on to these four things, if we can redefine them in our own lives, we can begin to see faith become as irresistible as Jesus hoped it always would be. So the first thing that we need to redefine is what Jesus would call brand new structure. See, for Jesus, the church is a body. It is not an empire. Jesus addressed this towards the end of his life. Literally, he was on trial. And a man by the name of Pontius Pilate was the one overseeing the trial, trying to figure out, is Jesus actually claiming to be a king? Because for, for Pilate, he worked for the Roman Empire. If Jesus wasn't claiming to be a king, this was a waste of time. But if Jesus was claiming to be a king, as everyone who'd brought him before him said that he was, this is a serious offense. And so Jesus and Pilate enter into this conversation, and, and this is what Jesus says, John 18, verse 36. 
Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus says, I'm a king, but it's not exactly what you are trying to get out of me. This is a different sort of thing. Jesus says, whatever it is I've come to establish and to set up, it doesn't require me to to submit and, and to say to you, I'm a king. He says, I have a different kind of kingdom. The apostle Paul, he traveled all around after Jesus' death and resurrection, and and he taught people about the kingdom of God. But when he did this, he almost always did it in the context of faith communities, individual faith communities that were starting and, and growing. He says, you are not a kingdom. You're not an empire. You are actually a body. Every one of you plays a significant role in what this is. The word that Paul often used for people is he called them ambassadors. He says, you're an ambassador for Jesus. You get to take the gospel into the lives of other people. He said it really specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. He says, now you are the body of Christ. And this last part is important. And each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you in this space right now and watching online with us, each one of you is a part of of the body. Now here's the problem. The temple model had a completely different idea about how this worked. The temple model said the way that you practice religion is you simply consume. You sit and you take it all in. The Jesus model though says something completely different. The Jesus model says you engage. Which, if you find yourself sitting at church and you aren't actively engaged with the body, Something is missing. And I'll tell you the truth. When that happens, we often think what's missing is something at church, but the thing that's missing is you. The thing that's missing is you being fully engaged. See, in the temple model, the religious experience was just about sit and receive. You got baptized so that God would bless you. You, you, you took communion so that God would be happy with you. It was like it, 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 was, it was bribing God by eating some bread and drinking some juice. You would get into a, a community group so that you could become a better person and people would think you were a better person. But the Jesus model is not about just consuming and just doing things so that God is not angry at you. The religious model for Jesus was never about you at all. We talked about this last week, right? The, the model that Jesus talked about is it's about the you that is beside you. Faith is not about you. Faith is about the person who is next to you. So the Jesus model says it's time to engage, and there's always competing forces that try to keep us from doing that. I I mean, I say this with an overwhelming amount of love in my heart. The temple model is the thing that, that we hear on Saturdays or on Sunday mornings when it's like an hour before church, and it's like, yeah, but you could just watch it later. You could just hear about the sermon from someone else. You could just play it later. No, the the Jesus model says, engage, be a part of it. You're part of the body. We need you. The Jesus model says that everyone is needed in order for this church thing to work. When you end up not engaging, all you do is cheat the body, which means you're cheating yourself. Why would you cheat yourself? You know, I would say it this way. If you are part of the body and you choose not to engage, you're, you're essentially an appendage that has been cut off. You're an amputated body part. And you know what amputated body parts are? They're just gross. So the point is, I guess, don't be gross. I didn't think that one through. But don't be gross. Engage. Be a part of the body. Be a part of the church. This is why we do a thing like Vision Night. How many of you were at Vision Night last night? Yeah, incredible, right? Those of you that weren't, you're going to find out over the next few weeks what you missed out on. But this is why engaging is so important, being a part of what God is actually doing here in the church. Can you imagine how that might begin to change us if we were to simply engage, not just sit in church and watch the message and listen to the music and go, oh, so good, but you actually step in, you get into a group, you begin to lead, you begin to serve. So so that's the first thing that Jesus redefined for us. The second thing that Jesus redefined, he gave us a brand new definition of authority. For Jesus, authority is exercised for the benefit of those being led, not the leaders. 
Jesus completely shifted the leadership paradigm upside down. He flipped the script on power. And believe it or not, this was one of the things that Jesus' disciples did not understand at all. It confused them completely. In fact, Jesus had these two disciples who were brothers, and one time their mom showed up and said, Jesus, I need to have a conversation with you about the, the role of my two sons. I mean, can you imagine your mom showing up to work and being like, I need to talk to your boss about the way he's treating you. His mom, their mom shows up, and she says, Jesus, when you go to heaven someday, can my son sit at your right and left hand? This was a question of authority, of power, of stature. Can my sons be your number two and your number three? Their mom approaches and Jesus is, I'm sure, sort of baffled by this question. But as she approaches him, this is the conversation that unfolds. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it says, Jesus called them together and says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And I imagine those two brothers were like, Jesus, we just sort of wanted a promotion. We don't want to become anyone's servant. We don't want to become anyone's slave. The word that Jesus uses for servant is the English word that we would best understand is courier. Someone who is a, a, a UPS man, a FedEx driver, a, a mail delivery person, someone who is carrying someone's stuff from one place to the next. They are at the, the will of the person who is sending a package. Jesus says, if you want to be great, you become a servant. You carry the burdens of people. And then he takes it a step further and says, not just if you want to be a servant. He says, you really want to be great, you become a slave. He says, if you really want to be great, you let go of your power. You relinquish it. You serve those who are in the most need. I think the best way for us to understand this, what Jesus is saying is if you want to be over, you have to learn how to be under. If you want to be over and have real power, you have to learn how to submit and be under. He says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to learn how to serve. You have to learn how to sacrifice. He completely flips the script on power. And then one night, Jesus wanted to give them a practical illustration of how this works. They were up one night having dinner. I'm sure his friends thought it was just going to be a casual conversation kind of night. And Jesus, in the middle of eating, all of a sudden stands up and he ties part of his robe around his waist and he gets some bowls that are full of water and he gets down on his knees and he begins to wash their feet. Now, some of you, some of you who are married, you know that you don't like touching your significant other's feet. They're gross. Now imagine if your significant other's feet had been walking through dirt and dust and grossness all day, and some of you are like, that's what it looks like now. But that's what Jesus, he gets down on the floor and comes face to face with toes and dirt and stuff between the toes, and he says, this is what it looks like to have power. He says, it's not about your authority level. It's not about your position on an org chart. It's not about the way that people submit to you when you have it, it's Power is what it looks like to give power up. And he looks at them and he says, I want you to do this forever. He says this in John chapter 13. He comes back to this idea as he's doing this. Verse 14, he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than, than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So let me ask you, if you ever find yourself, if you ever find yourself feeling really great, go and wash someone's feet. If you find yourself feeling like, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm crushing it at work, I I'm climbing up the ladder, I've got more and more people reporting me, it doesn't matter if you have 200 or 2,000 or two people that report to you and you're a manager of those people, wash their feet. Can you imagine if just as Christians, if we just got this part right? People would walk around and be like, I don't know if I believe, with, believe what Christians believe, but man, I want to work for one. People would want to work at the church just to work at the church. People would want to work for you as a Christian because you get the, 
you get the concept of power and how leadership and authority actually work. So if you find yourself at work crushing it, go serve someone that works for you. If you find yourself at home in your neighborhood, you're like, man, we got the white picket fence. We, we, we got the lawn trimmed. I got an RV and a boat. Why you would need both of those, I have no idea. We're just crushing it. We look like the perfect family. Man, I am doing great as a spouse. Man, go and serve your spouse and your kids and your family. Love and sacrifice for the people that you have power and authority with. Which leads us to the third thing that Jesus redefined for us. This is my favorite one tonight. He gave us a brand new understanding of marriage. For Jesus, marriage is characterized by mutual care and submission, not male domination, to which the women all said amen. And here's the truth. This was the one teaching that Jesus had that made people walk away from him. Now, I know what you're thinking. It wasn't the like, eat my, eat my flesh, drink my blood thing that freaked him out. No, it was this. When Jesus talked about the way he understood marriage, people lost it. Because in the world in which Jesus lived, and especially in the temple model view of the world, women were simply property. They had no opinion. They had no voice. They had no authority. Their, their voice didn't matter at home. You couldn't be a witness in court. Women were, they were traded. They were promised. They were second or third rate at best. While the perception of men was that they were the ones who were closer to God. They were up here and women were somewhere down here. And in that kind of world, Jesus shows up and he says, marriage is characterized not by male domination, but by genuine mutual care and submission. And when he, when he brings this up, it bothers people so deeply. Paul, a, a guy who, who followed Jesus later on in life, would talk about this, but he simply built on the idea that Jesus had. Jesus went out and he leveled the playing field. And when he taught about marriage, he didn't even really bring it up. In fact, some people brought it up to him. He had this group of men who approached him and said, Jesus, listen, um, we've been married for a while. You know, their spouses weren't there. They would have handled this much differently. They said, Jesus, we've been married for a while. And uh, we know what the, the, the law of Moses says. We know what the Ten Commandments say. We know what all those things say about marriage. But Jesus, here's the deal. Um, my wife is, man, she's getting older and uh, she's just not as pretty as she once was. This is my paraphrase for the record. You're not going to find this exactly in the Bible. He, one of them shows up and says, Jesus, um, my wife, she was working. She was earning a great income. But now she's not really, uh, <laughs> she's not really carrying the load around here like, like we need her to. Um, Jesus, my wife, she used to be a, a great mom. But now she's stressed out and she's tired. She's not really, I need somebody to clean, Jesus. So here's the question for you. Um, what do we have to do to divorce our wives and get away with it? So it's the question that they ask him. I know what Moses says, but Jesus, what do, you, what do you say about that? Now, I don't know what Jesus thought as he heard all of this. Ladies, I bet you could fill in the blanks on what he thought. But Jesus responds to it. And I'm not gonna read you exactly what his response is. You can read that later in Matthew 19, but this is what happens after he's done talking. Matthew 19, verse 10. Jesus' disciples then said to him, if this is the case, it's better not to marry. Their conclusion was, if what Jesus is saying we have to do is what, what it looks like to have a good, godly, holy marriage, we might as well not get married because I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can sacrifice. I don't know if I can elevate the status of someone so close to me. This was complicated for them because what Jesus was doing is he was replacing ownership with partnership. And this was groundbreaking. And years later, Paul, when he was talking to a church in Ephesus, he would say this about the way that he understands Jesus' understanding of marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, you've heard this before. Paul starts and simply says this, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, the role of a man and a woman in marriage is to submit to one another. 
Submit to one another. Why? Because that is the way that Jesus talked about power. That's the way that Jesus talked about authority. You submit to one another out of reverence for what Christ has done. Listen, Jesus was the example of what it looks like, the best example I can find of what it looks like to elevate the status and dignity of women. And if he did it, if he owned that, then I think the church should be a place that owns that as well. The church should be one of the places in the world where women are empowered to be leaders, to teach, to speak, to do everything that men can do because it's the way that Jesus saw the world. So Jesus, he gives us a brand new view of authority. He gives us a new structure on how the church can run. He, he gives us a view on what marriage is really supposed to be like. And the last thing I want to give you is that Jesus gives us a brand new definition of holiness. Holiness for Jesus was about being a part of rather than setting oneself apart from. See, in the Jesus movement, holiness was no longer about withdrawing from the world. It was about engaging with the world. It's not about withdrawing and and huddling up and being like, we're going to have a Christian Bible study and we're going to get our materials from a Christian bookstore and then after that we're all going to go to Christian aerobics and then Christian yoga and then is there a Christian restaurant because we'll go to that place. And then that wasn't what Jesus was about. Jesus was not about siloing faith away. It was about becoming holy so that you could open faith up for the rest of the world. It's not about disengaging from the world. It's about engaging with. The problem is, is as the temple model sort of diluted the vision that Jesus had, what we started to do was, was consider that, that sacred meant that, that we had to be separate. In order for something to be sacred, it had to get separated. And most of that came from how we read the Old Testament, how we read those laws that, that Moses handed out, and he spoke on behalf of of God, because the entire Old Testament is a story of a God who is rescuing a group of people and bringing them into the world to be eventually a blessing to the rest of the universe. And in order for that to happen, he's got to break some things down in their life. So he looked at them and he says, those people out there, I don't want you to eat like them, dress like them, interact with them. Don't marry those people. Don't raise your kids like those people. Some of you can think of people you don't want to raise your kids like now. He says, you are to be separate and different and apart from them because one day you will be a blessing to those people. And we've read that and skewed it to think, That's just what God wants from us now. We need to silo away. We need to become holy. We need to become separate. But Jesus redefines what holiness actually looks like. He says, I've got something brand new. I've got a brand new idea about what holiness is. And I think the best illustration of this is when John is writing his gospel. And in chapter one, he starts with this. We read this all around Christmas. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we read that at Christmas and we're like, oh, that's so sweet. We have a candle. The word became flesh is the grittiest way you could start a gospel. The God of the universe put on skin and bones and fingernails and those dirty toes your spouse has, and Jesus became human. See, the temple model would say, God would never do that. Why would God do that? Humans are dumb. You guys are idiots. You can't get anything right. God says, that's just not how this works. God steps into space and time and becomes just like you and I. And as an adult, as someone doing ministry, he eventually begins to move closest to the people that the world had moved furthest away from. He steps closer to them. The sick, the ones who have been uh, considered unholy and unworthy of anyone's time, energy, love, and affection, he moves closer and closer and closer until eventually he dies. He, he's essentially put on trial because he moved closer to those who were in the most need. As a sidebar, if there's someone in here tonight who feels like you are the furthest from being lovable. Like there's no part of you that is worth God's time and energy and affection. The very person of Jesus exists to prove you wrong. 
that it doesn't matter what has happened to you this week, this month, the last 365 days, God's love is not restrained by the places you feel like you failed. And Jesus set out to prove that, and they killed him. But there's this incredible moment, powerful moment, that we miss every time we read the Gospels. But when Luke wrote about what happened, the moment that Jesus breathed his last breath, this is what he says happened. He says, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now to give you a picture of this, the way that the temple was set up, there was an area where normal people could go. And then there was a space called the Holy of Holies where they believed God himself dwelled. And the way that it was separated was there was a curtain, a thick, heavy curtain from top to bottom, ceiling to floor. And what Luke says is the moment that Jesus died, the moment the world changed forever, the curtain split down the middle. It's as if God looked to the world and said, I cannot be contained here. You have my spirit. My love cannot be sheltered in a box. My presence cannot be contained. Luke is painting this beautiful picture that the moment Jesus laid his life down, it was evidence that God was coming to continue to engage with people, even the people who killed his son. See, holiness for Jesus was no longer about being set apart. It was about being a part of. In the Jesus movement, the holiest people are not the ones who get on stage every weekend. I'm, I'm probably the least holy person in this room. The holiest people in the Jesus movement have the dirtiest hands. They're the people who are down in the trenches with the world. The holiest people, if you go out that door, turn a left and then hang another left, are the volunteers who are taking care of your kids. The holiest people in the Jesus model are the small group leaders for high school kids who get woken up at 10 p.m. with phone calls and questions about faith and life. The holiest people are the people who show up every weekend to set up and tear down church. In the Jesus movement, the holiest people are not marked by clean hands. They're marked by the dirtiest hands because they are engaging with the world. We said this last week that the holiest man who ever lived, the holiest man who ever walked the face of the earth, changed your life, changed eternity, changed the world by being covered in the sins of all of us. Guys, Jesus, Jesus came to give us a brand new way to think about this. And can you imagine if we began to get this right? If we had a different idea about structure and how church even worked, that we could begin to engage in a brand new way. We would no longer just sit in rows or, or gather in circles even, but we would engage and be a part of the church. And it wouldn't be driven by obligation. I mean, imagine if every single, every single Christian with authority began to imagine what their job, what their career, what their workspace could look like. If they decided, you know what, I'm gonna leverage my authority for the sake of the people that I lead, not for myself. What if every husband and wife decided, you know what, we're gonna lay down our weapons, we're gonna enter into a submission competition and we are gonna serve one another like we never have before. What might happen to the marriages in our church? And what if we began to ask the question of, what does love require of me? Not how far can I get, not how close to the edge can I come, not how close to making a poor destructive choice can I get, but what does love require of me? When I'm on the highway and traffic is terrible, what does love require of me? When my kids and I are going at it, what does love require of me? When I post, when I talk to my coworkers, when I talk to my kids' teachers, what does love require of me? Because the truth is, that's the kind of Christianity that changes the world. That's the kind of churches that change the world. The churches that are made up of, of the people who know that power is not leveraged for themselves, but it's leveraged for others. And that is the kind of Christianity that can still change the world. And maybe in the midst of that change, God won't take us further into the future, but what he will do is take us backwards so that we can see the brand new way that Jesus wanted us to live. 
so that we can take the rest of the world into the future with us. Let me pray for you guys tonight. God, we love you and we are thankful for your son Jesus who gave us a new vision of how to live our lives. God, and in that vision, we have the opportunity to actually engage here at Compass, to not just sit and observe and watch and consume, but to be people who are full of the Spirit, stepping into community, stepping into to faith and growing because that's what you've invited us to do. God, we recognize that as the church, we get to leverage the power and authority that we have for those who are in the most need. For people who call Compass home, but for the people outside of the church who are poor and broken and marginalized, that you give us the space and the opportunity to do that. God, we're thankful that the brand new version of faith that you brought into the world is meant to transform our relationships and our marriages and that it's ultimately meant to give us a greater view of what holiness is. God, for the person who's in here and thinks, man, I've never been in on the church before, but that's the kind of church I can be behind. We ask that you would help them find a home here at Compass. God, we love you, we thank you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.